when we talked uh, about machine learning, there was a lot of things changing. What has happened in the last 12 months? <laughs> um, everything and nothing. Um, uh, the data sets are getting larger and larger, obviously. Um, the source code that's available now is improving. What you can do with it is even richer and richer. Um, uh, on the one hand, it's getting a lot easier to do sensor, uh, sensor fusion and uh, machine learning with it. On the other hand, it's still just as hard to do as it was before. Uh, the tools are difficult um, uh, to use, but the results you get from them are still shockingly amazing. Um, we're doing, for example, a, our company, so our first product is in the healthcare industry. Uh, we have a smart band-aid that is able to identify activities for elderly adults that are living at home. Uh, the fact that you can put that on person and watch them going throughout their day and identify activity 95, 98% of the time is just amazing. All you're doing is putting vibration into the sensor, from the sensor into a neural net, and it's able to see what's going on. Uh, us as humans, we look at the person walking through their, their kitchen and, okay, yeah, we, but we have so much data that goes into that image. When you're just dealing with a, you know, an XYZ stream off an accelerometer, um, it's phenomenal what you can get with that. That said, the pain to get there is enormous. You've got to collect truckloads of data, you've got to find ways to train it through this neural net, and you've got to find a way to run it in an inf inferencing environment in a repeatable high volume manner. Um, challenging. Um, has that changed from last year? I'm not sure I'm going to say that's gotten any easier. From a macro perspective, I think AI and machine learning, I know I call it AI, everyone else does, I, I cringe at the term myself. Uh, machine learning is really just a different way of computing results. The, um, for, I'm going to set the, the platform here because I think we need to define terms. I agree, I agree. I was the, going to say that. The way all of us were trained to code, to teach a computer, was you set a discrete set of steps, whether it's a for and next loop, whether it's a couple of assignments, you went through an algorithmic <coughs> programmatic way of defining activity. Machine learning is the opposite. You show examples to the code over and over again until it sees trends for you. Um, we're training neural networks with you know, 200,000 degrees of freedom. That's tiny. Um, but these degrees of freedom are able to see patterns in the data sets. That's completely different than how we had to do it before. Um, that is providing results that are rich and fascinating. Um, the world is using these results everywhere, and I don't even think we know where we're using it. Uh, to this day, you go to Google and you type one key, the, or the letter T, I get a different result from each of you. Um, that is being trained into neural nets that are adapted to each and every one of us. Um, we don't even know what's happening because it happens in milliseconds. This is happening all around us from Alexa. <coughs> so I think we don't even know how many places this is showing up. Sorry for the long introductory answer. Go for it. <laughs> so maybe, uh, you know, just to complement what Kevin said, right, a uh, couple of things in the last year, year and a half or so. One is, you know, there's been sensors available on, you know, devices for a long time right now. Remember starting off on G1 way back when in Android where we had two sensors, today you have 20 sensors, right? The number of sensors is an explosion going on. But the key thing is, how are we kind of taking all that input and where are we applying it, okay? So, you know, when you look at an ecosystem, I don't know what the audience here is, but I'll try to kind of break it down across three key, you know, trends that I'm seeing. One. In the ML space, to Kevin's point, uh, there's a lot of data available. How do you process them? How do you process them quickly? Specifically in this day and age of privacy, uh, you have exotic hardware which is available that you can use for tailor-made applications. An example is on phones today, instead of packing two cameras for depth, you're using one camera and an array of sensors to do processing on a discrete neural net uh, chip. That's something that's available on Pixel and a few other phones. So you're getting this exotic hardware and some things that uh, we are, I'm personally pretty excited about and using a lot is this array of small tie-based chips where we can run a lot of neural nets. That's one. And a corollary to that is way back when you look at the growth of mobile, right, it is a perfect marriage between what happened on the cloud and what happened on the device side. So we have those frameworks which are able to streamline or provide the continuum for what you do on the cloud as well as what you do on the edge. So some of the training aspects can be pushed to the cloud. Some of the inference and the prediction are pushed to things. That to me is a very, very strong trend which allows us to do a lot more things. 
I think the second one is, as uh, again to the earlier point on data sets, we, the data set is exploding you know, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And once you have this perfect storm of this data set, uh, you know, the problem of ML framing becomes a lot more crucial. I think you know, there's a lot of literature that's getting generated, a lot of work that's going on that allows us to apply ML in a pretty significant way versus you know, if we were to take a few years back, there's a lot of areas which were half-baked where we were not able to realize a full ML effect. Those are a couple of things that I would say has been very, very promising over the last year. We're still in the zero thinning of a nine-inning game, but a combination of sensors, exotic hardware, TensorFlow units, uh, information processing, sorry, image processing units, combination of sensors, I think that leads to a very rich uh, ecosystem of applications that can be developed. I'll surely, um, surely agree that uh, and, and the other uh, comment I have is that um, uh, there are certain uh, building block uh, technologies like uh, you know acceleration for image based solutions that's getting so low power that this is going to feed into the virtual cycle of generating more data, right? But hope that. The advantage of generating more data, not for the data's own sake, is that by now you know how to get labeled data because you have done the first gen, you've yeah. done the you know iteration. So uh, I think that uh, the virtual cycle is not in just generating a lot of dumb data, but it's starting to generate smart data or you know labeled data that you can use for training so that you can actually make the whole process a lot more efficient. And I think this. Uh, as this learning curve uh, gets shorter from generation one to two, um, this is going to really explode uh, yeah, because the value for the final users is increasing with every one of these learning. And then that then generates a whole new generation of users. So this is the, the virtual cycle, and I think we are, like, uh, like Guru was saying, we're in a very early stages of this, and, and I think that um, uh, this is also gives the fact that there is always more to do in terms of optimization at the edge um, is actually great opportunity, I think, from a sensor technology point of view because there is windows for introduction uh, that is a lot more pointed. It's, uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily like, you know, uh, and, and, you know, generating frameworks that, that allows for these windows, you know, would be the differentiator, I think, in terms of who gets faster and into this cycle. So, so really, the last 12 months has been about maturity phase. It's been getting better, half-baked concept got much better, nothing really new actually. If anything, you would probably do exactly the same now that you would have done 12 months ago. It's just that things have gotten better. I want to ask the audience actually, just to have a feel for our panelists, who has already deployed a product using machine learning? If you can raise your hand. One, two, okay, quite a few. Who is working on machine learning now but not yet deployed? Okay, that's, that's good. And who is just here for curiosity? <laughs> oh, say, very good, very good. You're in the right place, all of you. Okay, so what, is there anything you would have done differently? if it was today, but 12 months ago, in your projects? Because you have a very specific project, your product, and Guru is more on the platform side, so that would be interesting to know. So. Um, I, I think what I found, you know, you start off this machine learning project, you, you should sell it to your boss, your investors, and you say, hey, look, this is amazing, we're gonna, we're gonna be able to do this. You know, we've got these neural nets that are phenomenal. What I discovered, much to my, my shock, and I should have seen this coming, about 2% of the code is the neural nets. 98% um, of the code is the pipeline. Um, there's two different pipelines you'd have to build. Um, and this took us uh, years. Um, you have to measure the data, feed it into a way to store the data. You have to tag the data. You have to have codes that allow you to properly tag and super, supervise the data. You need to feed it into the neural nets and run the training. And there you hand it off to TensorFlow or something similar. That stuff you don't have to touch, it's open source. But then you have to burn that into um, a, a graph. That's one pipeline. The other pipeline is actually building the device that gets the data from the device into the, uh, the, the serving environment, the inferencing environment, getting that result out to the customer. 
98% of your code isn't actually running in the neural net or your effort. It's actually getting the data into the neural nets so you can do something with it. Um, I, I think I would have, I, I, it should have been obvious at the time, but we would have put much more effort into the um, pipeline part um, than the actual neural net part. The neural nets are fascinating, they're little black boxes, they're infuriating because they tell you nothing um, except um, when the results either work or don't. You just have to sort of twiddle knobs from the outside. Uh, so I think what I've learned from this is just how challenging the environment is and that most of the work is actually in the pipeline. So would you say that it's much better to have a high quality pipeline and a good enough choice of machine learning technologies by versa? I think the machine learning technologies available now are rich and phenomenal. Um, you know, the fact that Google, um, you know, kudos, frankly. You know, just think back, come on, 20 years from now, 20 years ago, if you'd had this really amazing code from, say, IBM, um, what would they have charged for it? Microsoft. You know, it would have been thousands of dollars a seat, tens of thousands of dollars a seat. Um, I can, I remember um, um, Cadence would charge us $250,000 a seat for their IC layout tools. Um, instead, we get TensorFlow for free. Um, we get updates every two to three months. I mean, we're on 1.11 right now. Uh, every two to three months, there's a hard cadence of new code releases. Um, they do it for good reason. They've got hundreds of thousands of people beating on this code looking for bugs. They don't need to hire all those people. They've got people making commits for them. So it works for them. But the codes that are available now are just phenomenal. Do you agree, Guru? <laughs> I agree with everything. I'll compliment to what Kevin said, right? I think uh, if you look back at, you know, I was telling earlier, right, there's a lot more literature available than here, also evolving. But I'll, you know, kind of uh, abstract a little bit here. So if you look at uh, the pipeline point that Kevin was making, if you were to pass that out, essentially it is, you know, you define your ML problem, you frame the problem, just say whether it's heuristics or ML, right? It's not a one size hammer that you can use for all of the things. So you frame your problem. Then you're like, okay, you know, what's the data I need? How am I collecting the data? It could be labeled, it could be unlabeled. You know, you could have your data all over the place. Then once that's done, you go through, you know, getting those data sets, training it, okay? Then is the biggest thing that needs to happen is to make a prediction in the ML flow. And that's where the ML stops. What you do with the prediction is the programming part. It's not the learning part, but that's a feedback loop. And just like humans, when you do something good, you get a reward, you want to make sure you have that reward system to continuously train that data. So that's a huge thing where, you know, sometimes, you know, a year back or two years back when you're doing a lot of ML, we didn't have that feedback step or we're allowing ML to make some of those decisions, which I think is not the right thing, A. And B, focusing on the feedback. I'll give you an example here. Let's assume you had a Roomba vacuum cleaner at home, right? And use NLP said, hey, go clean my bedroom. Okay, great. How does it know what the bedroom is? Okay, did it scan the house? And once it scanned the house, did it label itself, right? And if it scanned the house and it got the right bedroom, you want to make sure and tell Pat Roomba and say, this is great. You know what? You went to the bedroom. That's a feedback step. Then you get into your regular programming. But I think the key part is going through each of these phases. And when you do it, you know, the possibility or, you know, the fact that you're going to realize that model is pretty strong. And I think this literature, this framework, these models have become much more robust in breaking each of these steps in the last, I would say, 12 to 18 months. Neural networks have been there since I've been going to school. I'm an old guy, 20, 25, 30, 40 years. But the key thing is that the framework allows you to do things and not worry about a lot of these finer aspects. I think that's like the, the biggest thing I would encourage people to start looking at and also, you know, formulating problems along these lines. I just want to deep dive on this um, human feedback because we have IoT developers here. How important is it to incorporate this human feedback step in the design of your product? I think uh, there's a great deal of it. Again, it comes back to, you know, the problem frame, right? Let me give you an example. Uh, having you know, your photographs just be scanned and say, you know, these are all the faces that, these are the five faces these hundred photographs map to, right? Use cases like that, you don't need the human annotation, you don't need the feedback, mm -hmm. okay? But if you're telling, you know, hey, this is a dog, this is a cat, you know, 
So because of somebody's hairstyle, they're not going to look <laughs> different, right? That requires human <coughs> annotation, right? The machines, you can take it as far as you can, but you don't require that annotation. So for sensitive areas, critical areas, where prediction is of utmost importance, you do want to get for your training data set I think human in the loop is something that people don't consider, especially when they come from hardware or sensor first approach. Uh, that's kind of uh, one of my pet peeves is to come back from the other side. I think ultimately, uh, at some layer, human is interfacing with your technology, right? If you don't think of kind of the impedance mismatch between how you frame um, your view of the world and how humans will interpret it, you d it doesn't have to be the same. Right? It doesn't have to be the same at all. But I love the impedance mismatch analogy. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very important because if you add friction there, you're unnecessarily like causing a lot of loss of real information and data. If you can keep that human interaction as natural and smooth as possible, so that feedback is really enhancing both the human's you know, values or whatever the you know, value the algorithm brings, and the other way around, if, if that is interaction is smooth, the algorithm is going to get better in, in, in more fundamental ways than maybe even the narrow ways in which the human is thinking if this feedback is designed very well. So I think that, you know, uh, figuring out where in your stack or pipeline the human intervention can happen and how to make it uh, really uh, in a coherent way that can scale. Let me amplify that one with, with I think, I think a, a great example is Google. Um, we were, we were, last night we were, we were having dinner, and uh, I made the mistake of using the word gumption. Um, if you grew up in the States, the word gumption just means to, to, to not give up on something and to make something happen. Um, but there were some people at the table who didn't know what the word meant, and so they, they looked it up on Google. So there's an example of what are the listings that you get when you look up the word gumption. What is gumption? Well, there's 10,000, 100,000 possible website links that they could show you. How do they know what's the right one? Well, very quickly, when I tap on that, I just close the loop. I did a search, I got 10,000 results, and of those 10,000, I tapped one. A human just closed that loop, fed that back in. I never even knew I was doing it. I just wanted an answer. But I just trained Google. That happens a hundred million, a billion times a day. I think it's becoming increasingly clear you're working for Google. <laughs> <laughs> I like that technology. <laughs> actually, I want to touch on something you mentioned about free TensorFlow. And it actually touched about inclusion, and, and of course, we have IoT developers here who are on budget, but also around the world. How much can you do today, software-wise, for free, and do you get really high quality tools or you get medium quality tools? Okay. Um, I work for Google. This is clear now. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we're actually using Amazon for our, our serving platform. <laughs> um, uh, well, Amazon gave us a hundred thousand dollar credit. Google wouldn't bother. <laughs> it's very All simple. Right. We're stuck on Amazon now. Um, <laughs> life is really pretty easy that way. Um, I think that's one of the, the interesting things about TensorFlow in this particular case is it is a serving environment. Um, you actually can say, I want to do um, a server distribution across 100 servers. The back end for TensorFlow will do that load distribution, um, which is pretty phenomenal to be able to say, I've got a free piece of code that will let me split loads across 100 servers or 1,000 servers and handle it autonomously. Um, that's it. You know, the, the production environment, I think, is pretty impressive. In answer to your question, I think you can do just darn near everything. Uh, from the Python um, and development platforms you want, uh, I'm still amazed at what I can get on Python. I just worship Python and the NumPy and the, 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 the code bases behind it. Anything and everything you want is already coded, available in the library on Python. Um, so you can really go from one end to the other um, and do it all pretty much open source um, and have really robust you still got to pay for your hardware, and that racks up. Um, you know the, the server costs. But. And, and the sensors. Oh yeah, the sensors. <laughs> yeah. But but they're like pennies now, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> very high value. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
I guess, so, uh, just, to, sorry, just one quick point, right? I think uh, on TensorFlow, the two aspects to it, what Kevin was telling on the cloud side, and what do you do on the IoT and the Edge side, right? I think you will hear different names. What's happening on the IoT side, Edge or Client? Uh, going back to the earlier point, right, uh, wherein the marriage of client and cloud is what made the smartphones a success. And I think we are in a similar mode today. All the forces that are there today allows you to deploy things on the edge, do a lot of semantic processing, and do a similar thing <coughs> on the cloud. So you can take a model or you know, build a model on the cloud, train it, push it to IoT, consume all the data, <coughs> and get near real-time stuff. So a lot of these tools are available today, and I think one of the biggest things about open source and technology is innovation happens in layers, and you know, once the water level goes up, a lot of boats, big and small, can go. I think that's like the key takeaway. You know, kind of call out. Yeah, and I think uh, we are talking a lot of consumer like applications here, but it, these are all equally true in enterprise. As a matter of fact, uh, all these uh, all these observations are equally true in enterprise applications, and that's maybe one of the insights that was a little bit more not very intuitive for me. Um, in the consumer space, we all have seen this, you know, PC and then mobile story, and we can extrapolate to understanding. Um, but today, um, I won't name names, but there are very successful startups that have appended like industries that have been around forever. Um, for example, mission diagnostics. You can put a nice uh, set of sensors, the right ones, know some physics to understand how to set up the machine learning model, but not too much more, not too much more. And have these vibration units in everything that vibrates in uh, pumps, compressors, everything. Uh, and then make it seamless to get this data to the cloud. And then the labeling almost happens automatically because if you can get this infrastructure there cheap enough, then the business decisions are all in the digital world. So it, it, the, it's not as tough as one would think it is because the signatures of these machine learning models uh, of m multiple layers are so good that you can correlate that to very small number of activities of business decisions. And, and that automation then changes the game completely. You especially think about things like you know, scaling windmills and solar energy. It's very expensive to go get somebody to just check or download data from a windmill or to you know, get, uh, you know, it's so expensive that uh, automating that, you know, putting a machine learning model for predictive maintenance and things like that, are of humongous value for, uh, for, for those industries. So I think that there is an equally silent revolution happening on the, uh, on the enterprise side, not just on the consumer side, driven by all the same technology stack, um, you know, all open source stack, which is actually even more of a, a big deal in that space. I will say, I think one of the, the big holes that is yet to be built is I think on the embedded side. Um, I still remember a conversation at a TensorFlow conference where somebody said, what are you doing? We're, we're doing embedded machine learning. I said, oh, embedded, yeah, you're working on mobile phones. <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, I don't have a two gigahertz processor. I, I, you know, I've got a, you know, a couple of megahertz on an ARM Cortex-M4. What's that? Um, so I, I think the, the machine learning models are still absent on these small core. And I think that's going to be huge. I mean, the edge computing, I think, is massive, un, uh, untouched uh, real estate here for, for development. So what do you think about all these new chips that are coming up that are meant to run machine learning on uh, the Personally, AI? I laugh. Um, and, and that's because it's a, what, you're going to say, that's great. He's a vision guy. Um, I work with 50 hertz data streams. I don't work with 50 hertz frame streams, uh, video images. Um, I don't need a, you know, a, a gigaflop um, a vision processor, which is what they call a machine learning chip. Uh, I need an ARM Cortex M something that has a few extra Mac operations for matrix multiply that allows me to work and still keep this thing sub milliamp. Um, so there's a lot of these machine learning chips that are hundreds of milliamps, and I just laugh. I've got a 30 milliamp hour battery. Come on, guys. Uh, so I, I still, mean, there's an impedance mismatch there. There we could use that term again. <laughs> I think we're going to learn that term so well. <laughs> but does it mean that today, with this kind of very low power use case, and, and some of our developers would have that same use case, um, you're forced to only use trend models 
or is there some solutions to have some kind of learning along the way? Yeah. Oh, it's giving the path one to go. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to answer that one. I want to give. <laughs> so, uh, two part answer to this, but the first one I just want to, you know, uh, add to what Kevin said, right? Because the range of applications are, you know, all over the place from low footprint, low, you know, uh, power envelope stuff to richer IoTs. Like I walk into my house, I see like 20 IP address devices, all the way from two Nest Cam sitting in the front door to, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, but there's one thing that's happening though, which is where I think I'm very bullish about, you know, uh, the exotic hardware, like the NM processing units coming out, right? Which is, if you were to take a mobile phone today, right, the dominant use case was traditional photography, right? And as you go to machine vision, you don't need the same pipeline, the same richness. I can get a lot of machine vision use cases, okay, uh, without having the rich computational photographies of traditional human photography use cases. And when I have an ML chip on the edge, what happens is, the cost for the ML chip from a power perspective, power on all of them processing, goes down significantly, wherein the biggest cost is the camera cost or the imaging cost, right? And if you would extrapolate this, this equation is shifting across the board in a lot of use cases, okay? And this is where I think the more and more we're gonna see use cases come out, the power on loops are gonna become tighter and tighter, which means that the tensor flows and other models are gonna become more tighter, you're gonna see a lot more quantization, a lot more accuracy, a lot more models with data set that's going to come. Quick, uh, this thing on that. But, uh, so the second question, right? Uh, so to my question? Yes. Yeah, it's just a, a lost track of the question. Okay, so on the edge, are you forced to only use trend models? Or actually, could you have some kind of learning along the way? Yeah, I think learning framework, this is uh, this thing like TensorFlow release and learning framework this past uh, week or this uh, couple of weeks back, right? I think we are getting to a mode where you see very rich support available on the edge side, okay? When I say edge, I really mean like a Nest camera or something which has Neon Pod example, like A7 or so, where you have on-device compilation of models and you have training capabilities that are available. So I think we're going to get to a world where more and more data is going to get pushed down on the edge side whether you just want the semantic data to be rolled up, which means you have to do training. So 12 months from now, if I'm invited again, I think the key takeaway there would be, hey, there's a lot more training, a lot more reinforcement learning happening on the edge. I'll give you one quick data point, right? If you look at the security cameras which are there in the house, I'm just doing a quick math on it. On a daily basis, okay, uh, so I'll pick up a weekend, right? Go to my son's baseball game, two hours, record a video in 4K, okay? The bandwidth, uh, sort of the size of the video is 100th of what my Nest camera uploads to the Google Cloud, right? This is not a tenable path, so you're gonna see a lot more semantic processing that has to go on, that's a given, okay? And given all of this, you're gonna have a lot more training on the edge side. So Reggie or Kevin, do you want to elaborate more on this? Yeah? Well, I think there's the other thing is, not only do we want training on the edge, I think the frameworks is actually one of the limiter now, right? That's kind of what he's trying to point out. And whether more philosophically from a machine learning point of view, the question is, does that uh, training have to be um, also deep learning or could it be something else, right? That's still a little bit of an open question, uh, I think, and maybe that's where uh, more, you know, other uh, you know, other forms of machine learning, like you know, statistical or Bayesian models or other things, could be part of this loop after the initial core training. And and I think many of those are more fundamental uh, framework or like you know, uh, solution uh, questions that are still open. Uh, and and it's a, it's a question of uh, where the business model and volume might drive. You know, which is an option. I'm going to talk about something that sounded binary. A bit like the temperature here, it was so hot and now it's freezing cold. <laughs> um, we keep talking about cloud and edge, but Guru, you used the word I loved, which was continuum. Can you elaborate on what you meant by continuum between the cloud and the edge? Yeah, so let's go with the, the Nest Camera example that's given, right? I mean, what I mean by continuum is, you know, if the Nest Camera in my house detects something and you know it is not something that's available in the cloud it's going to parse that data 
on the left, onto the cloud, and the models with the feedback loop are going to get retrained. Okay. And you've got to go through that same pipeline where you take this additional data input, make sure you know you feed it to the model, train it, compile the model, or take that you know some semantic data, push it back on the edge side. Okay. Do either compilation or reinforcement on the edge side. This is what I mean by semantic. So where you're compute limited, okay, you're going to push data on the cloud side. Where you have resources, you're going to do the reinforcement training. But there's a constant handshake between the IoT and the cloud. This is the training. And of course, network boundaries and cost of that. Or cost of that. Yes, I think uh, uh, this is the, going back to the third trend line, right, with respect to reinforcement learning and power. Uh, we did a simple exercise this past uh, week uh, in my work, and we're like. If you were to do a lot of semantic processing on the net side, okay, and if you were to only send the semantic data, the power envelope, okay, is significantly less than opening a 5G socket or a Wi-Fi bandwidth and shipping the data to the cloud, right? So this equation is pretty profound, okay? Which means if you're going to be power constrained, you're going to imagine a scenario where you're going to have like 50 Nest cameras in your house or 50 whatever security cameras in your house. And if you can do a lot more processing, reduce the bandwidth, lower the power on the web, you're you become an overall energy efficient and you put it to the enterprise scale, you know, your economies are just going to be very different. And so this is another additional data point just to think about where we are getting to a model where we can scenario where we can shrink the models, drive the quantization, get reinforcement learning, which is a pretty compelling equation to push more uh, ML on the edge. I, mean, I, I think the, the, the example that comes to mind is, I, I think, the intentional networks. Um, as, as I walk down this aisle here, um, I am surrounded by, you know, or to say, if you, if you want to call my eyes a 4K image, I've got a 4K image as I'm walking down with billions of, or hundreds, hundreds of millions of pixels. I don't see all those pixels. I don't even think about all those pixels. My brain is able to pick out interesting things in my environment that I then focus on. Our current systems are taking every pixel and trying to process every pixel as I walk down the way. Highly inefficient. But it's the best we can do right now. I think what you're saying is in a way that I'm having a system that is able to have an attention-based metric that knows what is important in the local environment, pick those parts out, and send those up. It's effectively a pretty filtering system. But you have to be able to bring down that attentional network, that focusing system, locally, so you almost pre-filter 10x, 100x, and find out what's interesting. The challenge is what's interesting. Um, and that's auto-built into my brain. Each of us, as we walk down the aisle, we see certain things that are interesting. It's different for each of us. But still, we filter out the vast majority of that data. Actually, Reggie mentioned predictive maintenance. But predictive maintenance for industrial is not so, so dissimilar to what you're doing. If someone falls or has uh, hard rates and that doesn't sound good, from the machine learning point of view, you want that to be sent fairly quickly. Um, how do you, actually, so, so I had a question because I watched the Apple Watch, and they talked about having all this data about people falling. And we made the assumptions we can't collect the data of people falling because one, you can't ask people to fall because they won't really fall like they're supposed to fall if they don't mean it, or, or they don't mean it. Um, but the second is, where do you find this data? And clearly they managed to, to, to do that. But in your case, how, how do you collect this data which is extremely meaningful for your product? I think much like Raji was saying, it's almost a bootstrap method. Um, it, it's a bootstrap method. You start off with early models that are able to identify most of the cases. You start off with people, um, uh, for example, over here. in our particular case, we started off with mannequins. Um, you take firehouse mannequins, which weigh 100 pounds, you carry them along, thump them on the floor a couple hundred times, get you an early data set. Um, you start off with humans, and you say, well, you hire some people that are trained to handle falls, martial artists we use. And we said, okay, fall on the floor. You're right, humans cannot fall to the floor and injure themselves. They have autonomous mechanisms that prevent that. But you can get a large percentage of capability early on. Um, you can get networks that are able to identify, over-identify falls. 
but you then are able to capture that data in real life and get live natural data that you then can pick out and then you start building your data corpus of live actual false. I think your example of mannequin is really good because for IoT developers, sometimes you're like, where do I start to get this data? I didn't think of mannequin, but actually that makes sense. You get a first approximation. Do you have other examples? Also, don't forget how satisfying it is to be able to go and drop mannequins on the floor. <laughs> it just adds a little bit of joy to your day. Anyone wants to uh, work? But I didn't say that. I think there are other proxies, right? But you know, uh, Apple Watch, for example, or you know, gave other value, right, to the customers. So the so the idea is that you know you need to get a traction through um, a value proposition, uh, and quite often in the industrial IoT space, um, that value proposition uh, is not hard to find for the first one, and that's where you uh, from a uh, from a traction point of view, you start with the with the problems that are particularly thorny, right? Extreme weather, extreme environments, uh, places that it's really uh, prohibitive for other reasons to go in, uh, and then uh, you know you basically get your entry point. But then uh, that motor that's uh, you know going to fail on the top of the windmill or at the uh, some oil pipeline in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's going to fail more or less with the same vibration characteristic as something that's sitting right below your base in your basement, right? So now uh, uh, you you gain that data from these things, and then you can help scale it out to other uh, situations. So, so here I don't have inside knowledge about how Apple did it, but they did mention they managed to find three types of falling, and they had maybe a lot of data from their current users falling but they didn't have them then labeling the data, oh, I just fell. How do you think they managed to pick up this data that was not labeled and identified, oh, that, that looks like a fault. Let's deep dive on this. I can take that, yeah. So I think, uh, you know, you're, you're gonna have a lot of data that you're gonna be working with. Some cases, you're fortunate to have labeled data, right? And some cases, you're gonna not have labeled data, okay? So when you get this non-labeled data, Dominantly, you're dealing with this part of ML, which is called the unsupervised learning. So if you don't have a mannequin that Kevin can throw, right, you have an unsupervised data there, right? So that's like the thing. So typically, the class of problems you're looking for is clustering this data. You got all this data from, let's say, X number of users, you try to cluster them. And based on one or two samples, you try to draw a threshold and continue to look at the data, continue train the data. That's one example. The earlier example unrelated to that I was giving was, you know, you have 100 photographs, five people, you know, you can cluster it and say, okay, you know what, these 20 photographs belong to this person, okay? That's one example. The other one is association, right? So this is a kind of class of problems where you're gonna lean in with stats or statistics, then you're gonna look at the data, and the combination of clustering, you're gonna say, okay, great, hey, when this happens, you know, it is uh, an association rule. Simplest example, I don't know, maybe I'm more on the imaging side, on the user side, but maybe I'll pick up uh, a general use case that we come across on a daily basis. I'm buying hamburger, I buy buns. That's an association there, okay? So this is where I think you build out, once you look at a vast array of data set, you apply a bunch of these techniques, and then you get to this unsupervised mode. Then the question is, do you want to apply labels, or do you want to continue with that clustering to make predictions and build out your pipeline. So I'm going to take questions in about five minutes. So if you want to start thinking about your questions, um, what do you think is going to be the most mini meaningful breakthrough in machine learning in the coming three years? Because we talked about the last 12 months was really about maturity and getting more bigger data set and better technology, most of it for free. What do you expect is the biggest change in the next 24 months? Something that IoT developers that are right now designing their product could think about. So as you can imagine, based on everything that I said, I'm more an apps and a system software guy, right? So I'll give one example or you know, use case there. Uh, one of the biggest things that happened in the software industry over the last 20 years was component-based software, right? It's like you going by your screw from a store, right? Today, if I need to consume, let's say, Kevin's service, 
He just need to expose an API and I just use it and I go off. I don't have to worry about the internal details, the internal pipeline, the plumbing and the wiring that might be in a system. Okay. So this was, I think, you know, one of the biggest things that happened on software. I think in the next few months, I would expect to see a lot more ML services that I can plug in. Okay, an example is uh, Nicholas is talking in French. I don't understand French. I'm talking in English. There's an NLP system that comes in, does on the fly, on the fly translation. Okay, so just imagine this NLP going to a whole bunch of areas or ML services that you can plug and play becomes component. Okay. Uh, Kevin's example of you know algorithms that he has which can plug into insurance systems or into other medical systems. So that becoming a component as I would see is like the dominant thing from an OS ML becoming a dominant play for a smarter application processing or a smarter OS. That's like the top trend that I see. And maybe a double click on this. Is there anything different in terms of calling the services compared to calling software libraries in terms of APIs? I think making, just like you know, to the earlier point on Python, the more simpler it is, the more it is uh, kind of gelling with the lingua franca of the programming languages, the more successful it's going to become. So I think one of the things that we should be doing is just kind of weave that in into the application fabric. Yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. All right, the question is the next 24 months, Raji. You always look into the future. So. <laughs> sure. I, I think that you know NLP is a great touch point. I think there are uh, certain uh, certain hard problems that have been um, uh, really not solved to a degree in which it can be practically implemented or getting solved. And that's a combination of uh, <coughs> label data and you know uh, intense focus and you know. Uh, just a lot of million dollar paid researchers, whatever, like, you know, the combination of all those things. And one of them is surely in uh, language, and I think uh, uh, a natural language processing is a really broad, uh, broad uh, building block tool, and when you get to certain success rates, um, it, it, it completely changes the threshold for what kind of applications you can uh, generate on top of it. Uh, and then, like you know, finding this vicious cycle loop of, uh, with that, how do you make it better, right? When when you hit this, like you know, from 40, 50 percent accuracy rate to like 85, uh, then that last 10, 15 uh, is uh, can be uh, accelerated with the right business models on top of it. So I think there's a lot of uh, that coming. And I would say my favorite thing is you know NLP for enterprise. I call that the UNLP, right? There are some challenges. Uh, uh, when uh, you know you go into it, when Sense or any of our companies, we have all these three-letter acronyms, you know, verbs that we use as nouns, nouns that we use as verbs, uh, you know, yes. and and that is in itself another language, right? And and I think that there are problems to be solved there, but but this frameworks, you know, so I think this is going to be both enterprise class and consumer class based on kind of uh, language models that's going to really take off. And what it means for sensors is, uh, you know, uh, it's very obvious with the audio, uh, but I think it means a lot more than just audio because context, where you are, who else is there, you know, what else is going on in the world, all this is important for language to be, uh, you know, really good, right? So, so I feel like the sensing ecosystem is going to really get accelerated in terms of adoption in various applications that you may not have because of this. I, I've got two thoughts there. One is I, I really like your, the, the earlier points about one, the, the rising tide lifts more boats. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was really interested uh, to hear about universal sensor sentence embeddings, which is an odd concept and may, may, may not make any sense at all. Um, when I say the word apple, each and every one of us in this room has a vision in our brain of an apple. It comes up. That apple is coded in your brains and neurons, but every single person in this room has a different embedding. You have a different set of neurons, but they all come up with the same result. They all allow you to see an apple. Well, the challenge has been in computers is how to come up with a way to embed the word apple, to have almost a vector, if you will, that describes apple in terms of a neural net. Well, now they've built some. They've taken billions of sentences, run them through a really deep neural net, and now you can get this neural net. You can download it for free off GitHub. That is a universal sentence embeddings. 
You can take any English sentence in a bunch of other languages as well, and it will get you a vector. Think about that. Now you can take any arbitrary sentence and now have a comparable vector that allows you to compare it with other sentences. You can do math on those sentences. The, the classic ones where you, you take, what was it, <laughs> king, uh, what, was, what was the example, king minus male um, is, is equal to queen what? And you can take, well obviously king is to male as queen is to female. Well this sort of math operations are now feasible with some of these, um, these embeddings. Fascinating. The idea that you can actually take language and actually embed it down to these core concepts. We do it automatically. So these tools are broadly available. It used to be if you wanted to have a microphone or an audio in an NLP based system, you had to go build your own. Well, you can actually now license Alexa um, from Amazon and plug it into your product. Yeah, they're going to charge you, but you don't end up spending $100 million trying to build your own NLP system that doesn't work very well. But now it's just a tool. You just license it and plug it into your system. There are so many of these other capabilities and libraries that are just now available. I think the second point I want to make in the, in the next 24 hours, I would challenge each of you, all of us, I assume most of us here are engineers, um, you've all been trained to think programmatically. That when you try and solve a problem, you go through Excel spreadsheet and you have these nice programmatic steps. Try and challenge yourself to see what problems are in front of you that you can just train a neural network with. I, I know that that's, it's a bizarre statement to try and absorb if you haven't done it before. There are free courses available like Coursera and other places where you can learn this stuff. Once you start seeing problems this way, it's shocking how many of them are much easier to solve than trying to build code. Code tends to be very rigid, very fragile. Um, it covers cases very well, but it misses corner cases terribly. Uh, neural nets in many cases can solve these. So I would challenge people to try and look at these tools that are available, leverage them, many of them are free, um, and try and think about these problems in a different way. Um, you might find some of the problems that are insanely hard um, actually turn out to be much easier in some of these new, you know, it's like change, looking at the statue from the other side, suddenly you see problems, solutions are easy in that environment that are hard in this. Actually, I think that's what we're talking about. Um, we talked about the free tools, but the free education we get from the top experts. Coursera, do you have two or three you would recommend people to watch? Uh, 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 YouTube videos or? or, or yeah, wait, a few videos uh, you would, yeah. I'm, alas, I'm not very good at that. Okay. <laughs> I don't have uh, YouTube videos of course, but the, the one, we had a great topic uh, conversation yesterday at uh, dinner uh, for the panel and the classroom meeting. This is about perception and creativity, right? And mm -hmm. a great part of sensors is perception, okay? Uh, so one of my colleagues, his name is uh, Blaise Aguirre Arcas, who leads the machine intelligence team at Google. He has this great thing where they've taken uh, you know, art and created new art. Beautiful TED video, it's worth 10 minutes. I think it'll lead you into what Kevin is telling us. Like, great, if this is what is happening, how do I start doing it? Not just for art, but for other areas as well. So, strongly agree with that. Yeah. And, and I think what Kevin is really telling is that uh, we all need to retool, reframe, uh, and retrain ourselves. And I think the first. Uh, uh, the point is like, you know, when, uh, when there is, this is a very philosophical idea, I think that we have conquered how to kind of manipulate atoms and molecules. That's the last hundred years. We, you know, things that, you know, we, we can do very high temperature, high pressure, high, all this, all this stuff that, you know, people in uh, here understand. Um, but really the next, uh, next uh, set of innovations is going to come from, uh, not really thinking physical first, but really completely metaphysical level or data first, right? And, and think about concepts of you know representation first, very different layer of abstraction first, and then reinterpreting what it means for physics or you know physical things. And, and I think uh, that's a very hard transition, but I think that uh, there are lots of tools now that are available. It's uh, uh, that will change the way we think about the problem. So I have la one last question before I open questions to the floor. That's kind of a transition. When we think about machine learning, I feel like um, it gives an opportunity for small companies to be highly competitive. And if you think about the past, when you have very big companies, they have a competitive advantage because they are big. 
And I've heard sometimes people saying, oh, I can't compete with Apple and Facebook and Google. They have so much data and they have all these experts. But actually, the data is not specific to a use case. So how do you feel uh, one of our IoT developers who's got a very meaningful use case, how does he go about being very competitive and actually not have to worry about Apple and Google and the big guys? I, I think that's a great one. Uh, obviously, the big use cases, uh, natural language, uh, vision recognition, autonomous driving. OK, there's a couple billion dollars or beyond, tens of billions that are already into that. That doesn't mean there's thousands tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of applications that have not even been touched yet. They're fascinating, they're sitting out there, they're waiting for someone to identify them. Um, I think the tools that are available right now make it easy for, you know, we were talking about last night, is the, 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 the old idea was if you wanted to go into a, you know, a great startup, you had to go to the great university, to access the great professors, you had to go to Stanford and say, oh, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've taken a lecture from this great professor. I, I could be living in Mumbai. I could be living in Belgrade. I could be living in um, uh, Argentina and have access to the same Coursera. I can see Andrew Ang teach his course on machine learning anywhere on the planet and pretty much get it for free. There is one of the best minds on the planet and it doesn't matter where you are, you can teach yourself Python, you can get access to the best language, the best lectures, the best information. The, the playing field is just so much fun that you have access to it. I think you can do amazing things. And I, I, the real question is the vision to say, that's the problem that needs to be solved. Because it's not gonna be Apple that's gonna look at that little tiny little niche, but there's a great use case for that that you can look at, identify, and solve. I think I'll add a couple of more things to that. One is where do you see heuristics? You know, think about how you can put that into ML. Like, how much memory do you want to allocate for this process? How can it be dynamic? Once you go into multi-cores, you have large machines. How can you take a lot of this data based on usage, what you can do, right? So again, a fairly complex example, but the key word there is heuristics. So where you see a lot of heuristics, and if you think that heuristics is applicable at scale, that's a classical framing for ML, okay? And uh, one example I would kind of give you is photography, right? For those of us who have kids, every weekend is, you know, baseball game or tennis game, we shoot a lot, a lot of photographs, okay? So one of the things was, how can we make it in a way where we don't have to shoot photographs, a photograph, you know, there's a device or whatever that shoots itself automatically, or it takes photographs automatically. And, uh, you know, how can it be fairly smart enough, right? So this is the birth of a product called Google Clips. Again, the thinking there is daily usage, you're doing it at scale, where can you automate, where can you apply ML and apply some smarts, right? That's a classical scenario. Uh, I'm not sure if the product was successful or not, but it's a frameless photography. It's a kind of a clip that you put on your shirt. Mm -hmm. It knows who you are with, where you are with. It kind of, based on a certain segmentation of objects, figures out, I want to shoot this photograph. Can you solve it at scale? Great. And there's a whole bunch of these use cases where the big companies are not going to go behind, where there's a scale, uh, there is a cost benefit, there's an IoT use case, there is a proliferation of you know, solutions that are supposed to just a plug, we have a Mauritius chip. Not a clever plug. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I agree. I think that, you know, heuristics is a good way to think about it. Um, I think in terms of uh, 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 the other space where uh, how to get started is probably like, you know, uh, not underestimating uh, enterprise, especially small and medium businesses. That's another conversation I had offline is uh, people tend to think uh, of, uh, you know, consumer as being a very large market or, and then like, then this very large enterprise market. But I think there's a lot of in between um, that uh, that's like, you know, really something that uh, can, uh, uh, that innovation is waiting to happen. And, and, you know, Square is an example of it, right? You find a problem uh, statement that's unique to that. Uh, and they are giving the big kahunas a run for the money. So I think there is, uh, uh, the other thing is, you know, the big companies tend to have a barrier that it needs to be big enough to even get started. So when you are outside, uh, it's uh, it's really uh, good to have a vision, but you don't have to have that uh, barrier of seeing that big market. Maybe you can make it because your solution is just so compelling. Uh, thank you. So I'm opening to questions. Who would like to ask your questions to our panelists? 
No? No questions? Yes. Thanks, Zach. I think this was a great learning opportunity. I think everybody presented great different perspectives. Uh, my question uh, is for Kevin. Uh, you mentioned that uh, sometimes people are surprised when you speak about uh, embedded machine learning applications. I, I want to learn a little bit more of where that comes from. I think most people don't understand embedded. Um, uh, the, the, I think the people in this room probably understand embedded, um, but the rest of the population, the rest of the engineering community doesn't really get it. Um, they're used to the big cores either in a desktop machine or the mobile machines nowadays are not that similar to a desktop anyway. They're multi gigahertz. Um, I, it is my belief, if you look at the mathematics behind uh, uh, a deep neural net, it's really a bunch of matrix multiplies. Let, let's be honest, yeah, there's, there's a couple of exponentials in there, but it's really a bunch of matrix multiplies. You know, small and arm of M4, M7, they're actually quite good at that. Uh, you know, they, they've got, you know, M7's got a, a floating point multiply, they got a multiply accumulate. Um, they're actually fairly efficient at that. So I don't think there's any real barrier uh, to bringing um, uh, these neural nets into an embedded environment. I just don't think a lot of people have focused on that. Um, I think there's a good fit. I think we're, one of the, the interesting challenges is you end up having different granularity in the networks. Um, if I've got a server, I can do a couple million degrees of freedom and compute it regularly and fairly cheaply. I can't even fit that in the memory uh, and down in the embedded. Okay, I can squeeze my network. I lose some of the granularity and resolution, but that's often good enough. I can now quickly look at a scene and identify that something's interesting. Discard most of the information. Say, this is interesting, grab it, send it up to a bigger brain, a bigger network to actually do some really fine detail. So I think there's some really interesting you know, granularity. The continuum you spoke of, I really like, because um, I think there will be a continuum where you have a small chip that's doing basic processing and sends that up to a phone, which does a little bit more detail, and then sends it up to a cloud to do the big stuff. In any case, like a year off, yeah, yes. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. But I do think there are some missing libraries there. Um, I really, we're not seeing them yet. Maybe they're, they are and they're missing them, and they've just come out. But I still think there's an absence, a dearth of um, uh, machine learning deep neural net libraries that run on real embedded. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'd like to have an A7, but I don't have an A7. Wait, wait, um, are you saying there's fake embedded now? <laughs> 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 well, they, 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 a lot of them are designed to run on A7s, A10s, A53s, okay. um, but they don't run on the M cores. Okay. Um, and so I, I, I tend to come from a, a deep embedded. Do I, do I have to use deep embedded? Yeah, that would be Limited, restricted. Yeah. Yeah. Calling embedded limited. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Guru, do you want to expand? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. Good. nothing more to add to that. All right. Any other questions? Yes, please. someone else because last year like Kevin to... took all the questions. <laughs> he's, he's going back here next year. <laughs> it's a competition. <laughs> so I think, um, I don't know much about calibration, but I'll talk about sensor fusion, right? I mean, dominantly, you know, with respect to sensor fusion, that's a great uh, scenario, sorry, the great candidate for ML. Because what are you trying to do is, you know, you try and take a whole bunch of sensors, do processing either on the hardware or on the CPU, right? And uh, despite all the CPUs that you can give people like, you know, me who have been on the mobile for a while, it's still not enough, right? And you're operating in a thermal power uh, constraint, so on and so forth. But based on the usages, you can do a lot more things by way of coming out with these models, either by way of NLP, which is a structured output model, okay? So you're telling, I'm going to move my head, I'm taking a bunch of poses, fusion, and telling which way I'm moving, right? That's a classical candidate to offload 
to an ML chip, either you do it on a GPU or you have a discrete hardware. Um, and that's nothing but a perception-based use case. Okay? So where are you looking at sensor fusion? That's a great candidate where once you have some of the staining data, you can A, amplify the user experience, operate at a lower power budget, you can use simpler and you know deploy CPUs or solutions at scale, just given this. The calibration, I don't know much about, but if you were to make an argument about continued usage and accommodating for that, you know, if you will, fidelity loss, uh, I think like, that's also something that you can feed into a model by way of feedback. I'll, I'll take it a step. Calibration is historically done with Kalman filters, um, estimation filters, of which machine learning is, I, I've seen some interesting work where people are trying to build um, sort of closed loop type uh, machine learning systems. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the reinforcement learning can be done where you actually have goal following. Um, there's some work being done on it. Um, historically, you need a Kalman filter to be able to do parameter estimation, estimation or you know, you're looking at the bias terms on uh, Gyro or in Excel. I don't know. I mean, the common filters are always so computationally constrained. Um, you know, you're counting the number of states. Machine learning, you're typically dealing with hundreds of thousands of states. Common filters um, designers would laugh if they could get more. Uh, they'd be shocked if they could get more than a couple dozen states. Um, so it's a completely different environment. Um, I don't. I, I think there's some effort that could be done for that, uh, but I'm not sure if it's ready uh, in the mainstream yet. I'm not sure. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Great. One more question? Yes. Well, my question is partly for fun, but um, like you mentioned that uh, Amazon gives maybe 100,000 if, if, if it looks good, and um, you know, Google has TensorFlow and all this, and you mentioned that startups can do some amazing things, so what can you do to continue fostering this ecosystem where these big guys keep offering more and more for free because they make lots of money on the servers, but, but enable sort of startups to do these really interesting things using their platforms. Is, is there anything, you know, that can be done to keep fostering this, this amazing ecosystem so that uh, um, it's really um, good for, for, for innovation of, of little guys? <laughs> I love the ecosystem question. So guys, this is where you can commit to something big today. <laughs> Good, that's a, that's a very interesting question, having been with Linux for a while, right? I mean, open source, the benefits, et cetera. Maybe I'll take a different take on this. It kind of answers the first question that was there for the object embedding. Like one of the areas which is very nascent is federated learning. You have a set of smaller devices like going back to my Nest camera example, I'm not picking on Nest there, but going to a security camera example, if the camera in front of my house can you know, talk to the camera in front of the garage and share data and apply some of the embeddings, that kind of distributes it. And use cases like that, which is gonna proliferate, means that you know, you're gonna get more and more people, either the big companies or the community, which are gonna come out and provide tools. It's a great part of these tools you know, come out from you know some of these big companies, but a vast majority of them are available on GitHub. People providing libraries, people providing frameworks. Like today, you know, I don't use a SysTrace to profile what my ML model is doing. That's available at Google. I use one that somebody else has provided. Okay, and these are all the other things where the more use cases proliferate, if not the big companies, the smaller folks or somebody who are hobbyists will come out and provide those offerings or the gaps are complemented. And that's something that I saw in Linux, a big believer in the Linux is open source. I think the same similar thing will happen with ML as well. Well, I mean, I'm not talking officially. Um, I am not in the ecosystem uh, engagement team. Uh, but I think that there is no barrier. I don't think there is anybody putting on brakes. This is, this is a truck rolling downhill. I don't think you need to do anything really. Um, and in terms of even hardware, right, uh, partnerships, uh, I can surely talk in the past, right? Uh, it's not very difficult to get the latest and greatest accelerator and embedded chip samples from any one of the big guys. I mean, I Intel has done a few big acquisitions, and for example, Movidius chip, uh, uh, yesterday I was just in the valley, and I met 
bunch of people using the Modius plugin thumb drive to uh, experiment and plan. And, and, and th so these are, uh, these are not, uh, uh, and there's no barrier. This is not even physical. I mean, we have, you know, these things get shipped all over the world. I think it's the last week I was at a conference where people use this uh, in, uh, in Bangalore and in, and in Europe and build these things. And all the support was over there, all the code is online. So I think there is really no barrier uh, uh, to innovation uh, in, in many of this space. Maybe there's, actually I would say that it's the other way. I think there's a little bit of overload of information. So try to find the right tools and the right solutions for your particular problem statement, right? That may be actually harder than just availability of resources. Yeah, back to Guru's point about framing the problem you're trying to solve. Kevin, especially from your experience, because you went through that. Right, I was sitting here mulling this through the, the, the various responses. I, I think from a startup perspective, um, you know, I'll, I'll get on my, my soapbox for a moment about the capital markets. I think the capital markets for startups have been troublesome lately. Um, the, the capital, the venture capitalists have gotten so addicted to their 10 baggers, um, their 10x returns on their startups that they just won't touch anybody if it's not unicorn material. Um, uh, the, 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 the old world was that if you had a good startup, you could go and get your couple million dollar uh, Series A round from a good VC, and you start coding. Um, now, they're, they're, we've gone to 100 venture capitalists, seriously, and they're, they're, you know, the standard response is, come back to us when you have revenue. Well, I, I, <laughs> what do I need to do to get revenue before I can act? I, I got this gap here. I, and so you go to the angels, and the angels have come back, and they've got they figured out this game too. They said, "Oh yeah, we love what you're doing. Come back when you have revenue." And I'm like, "Wait a minute, did we, did we, we had to get to revenue." Uh, so I think the, the from a startup community, I think it's maybe it's because there's too many startups, or the uh, the, the, the investors have gotten very used to their high return. Um, they're really getting very picky, and I think that's been even though it's much cheaper than ever to get a startup going. Um, it's still, it's even more challenging than ever, I think, to get them capitalized. Um, and I, I'm not sure how the, the value is going to figure that one out yet. Um, but, you know, that's, that, that's what we're seeing. It, it's still very difficult to get uh, uh, startups capitalized these days. So I think, Kevin, because you talk about venture capital, I'm going to do a shameless plug. Mm -hmm. At 4.30 today, we are going to have a general partner of Foundation Capital, Paul Holland. And Enrique Hallen from uh, Designer Farm going to talk around humanizing the digital experience. But we will cover also some of what you just very said. Good. Yes. So I want to finish with a very simple question, because normally Kevin does that every time. Is there a book you would like to recommend to the audience? Oh. <laughs> I know you have 20, but just one. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to choose Kevin Kelly's uh, Inevitable. I, I mentioned it at dinner last night. Um, it's one of my favorites. I, I have read that over and over again. His vision of the future, he takes 12 different inevitables uh, that he talks about. He, he's, he's well quoted for his statement that the, the next 10,000 business plans are easy. You take X and ag, add AI. Um, you take the doorknob and add AI. You take the dishwasher and you add AI. Um, uh, th those are obvious statements, but more to his point, some of his visions I think about um, uh, commerce and work and whatnot. I think are really compelling. Uh, they're close enough to reality that I, I really believe that they're going to happen. Um, so you know, I, I really like Inevitable by Kevin Kelly. And it's organized in 12 verbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's really good. Guru? Um, second, you talked about perception, creativity, where you can apply ML. You know, more than ML, it's more the learning part. How do we go through that motion, recognizing problems? I think one over the last year, I must have read like three or four times, was Steven Pinker's The Language Instinct. Um, strongly recommend that. Uh, I think he has one more book this year, which made it to Bill Gates' uh, top 12 books that Bill Gates uh, uh, kind of calls it out every summer, uh, which is on, you know, you just need to be optimistic in the world. I think that's the title, if I'm not wrong. So. Thank you. Well, I think this is, I'm uh, on the hot seat here. Uh, but I, I think actually, uh, this is uh, based on the conversation that came up, and I think you uh, need to also think a little bit outside the Silicon Valley bubble. And, uh, you know, one of the suggestions, it's one of my favorite books, is, uh, you know, Jugad Innovation, yeah, right? Yeah, it's a great book. Uh, it's an it's, it's Indian-style idea of what is, you know, gumption, how do you innovate uh, uh, 
uh, think by thinking differently, right? Thinking uh, with just a can-do attitude, given what the resources, not what should I do, right? Or how must I solve? Rather, like you know, how do I solve? Uh, Juga innovation, okay, yeah, yeah. So I think that's uh, that's surely a way to uh, maybe at least transport temporarily outside of the bubble. <laughs> Yeah, and it's great advice here for startups. It's it's really really good work. Thank you. Please uh, join me to thank these really good panelists. Thank you. Thank you.